right. Well, hey, thanks everybody for showing up today, whether you're showing up here in person in Seattle or you're showing up at home and tuning in. I really appreciate you dedicating a bit of your time for us. I realize this seems and feels like a long session, 50 minutes. I promise you one thing. I am not going to be the only one entertaining you today. I have invited Stefano to join me as well, and he's going to take us down a technical path in just a little bit. But for now, let me kind of bring you up to speed on where Risk Five has been, where we're going, what we're excited about, and what consumes us and, and brings us passion every single day. So I'm Callista, and you, and I think I've skipped ahead a few slides. I've skipped ahead a lot of slides. Big sneak peek. Oh, I'm going the wrong direction. All right, we're going to get this all sorted out. <laughs> we're way ahead of where we thought we would be. All right. We're starting this from the beginning now. All right. So. Linux is having a birthday or an anniversary. It's been here now for 30 years, and RISC architecture has been here almost that long as well. We've been actually, well, actually a bit longer, I think. We've been around since the mid 80s. And what is exciting and interesting for us is that we're taking the ideology and the collaboration that you find in open source software and we've brought it to hardware. Because what we found is that barriers come down competition comes up, innovation explodes when you collaborate and work together. So we're taking the lessons learned in software and applying them to hardware. And there's never been a brighter time to be part of this. So RISC-V is the free and open instruction set architecture. It acts more like a standard. In fact, once you freeze it, you need to kind of leave it sit there because unlike software, you don't have the uh, the liberties of continuous integration and development, you freeze it, and then you add on to it in different ways. Many traditional architectures have added on to an, an incremental approach. Thus, over time, that set of code gets larger and larger. And in, for RISC-V, we add on to it in a more modular approach so that you can pick and choose the extensions that fit for the implementation you're going after. That is why it is so disruptive. So the disruptive aspect of the technology is not just in how it is composed, but in the freedom and liberties you have to take it forward. So when you take a modular approach with an open platform, you are no longer constrained by the barriers of your original proprietary agreement. You can go ahead and design and keep that design flexible as you continue to iterate. One design may then morph into an adjacent space. You can take it into a new field. And that is something that you can do with RISC-V that is unlike any other architecture. That brings you lots of opportunity. So along with the disruptive technology, you also have disrupted opportunity. And that opportunity is very meaningful. I don't know how many of you have gotten to go up the food chain to ask for funding, to ask for resources, to go do something new and cool at work. In my experience of doing that, you don't get to go because it's a cool new technology. You get to go because you've found more revenue streams, you've lowered costs, you've accelerated development plans, or you've removed risk from a particular strategy you're on. And these are all very important business decisions that go along with the technical cool factor that you've found or the implementation that you're about to deliver on. In the case of RISC-V, those barriers of design costs, of IP licensing, have gone away. And this has ushered in a tremendous area, era of innovation. We have now more design houses on RISC-V than any other architecture. And there are several to choose from. In fact, there are more uh, innovative designs going on in RISC-V than there were architectures in the mid-80s. If some of you dial back in history, you'll think that was the last time there was a renaissance in hardware architecture innovation. And it was the competition of many different architectures that led to a few proprietary approaches. And now we're taking a much more open approach 
And we are well on our way to cementing RISC-V as the foundation of computing for the next several decades to come, if not more. So how big and what is the size of uh, the opportunity that we're talking about? Keep going. There we go. So overall, we've seen an explosion in microprocessors. Internet of Things embedded. You, ha you have microprocessors in your toothbrush, in your toaster, in your data center, in HPC, in your car. Everywhere you turn, there is now a proliferation of microprocessors. This is true not only in large implementations, but very small. And in many cases, such as your cell phone, you may have a dozen processors there alone. This does not mean that you need to select just one architecture. In fact, you can have many architectures. The explosion of opportunity is there across all architectures. And we're seeing and feeling from our community, many are choosing kind of the best architecture to fit. And there may be more than one architecture on a chip alone. So this brings about an explosion of opportunity. And by the way, we're about here. This is important to note because in many <laughs> of these charts, you're going to see the same visual, but we're at a different point in the timeline. So even OEMs are starting to design more and more of their own ASICs, and this is something that is continuing to grow. This can mean anything from the laptop on your desk to a white box in a hyperscale data center. Many are continuing to design their own uh, ASICs. This is a great chart. This is one of my favorites because the first time, well, the first year that I was presenting this particular chart, that number said 62 million or billion RISC-V cores by 2025. This last spring, they updated the research and said, well, actually we were off by like 20 billion. So now the number is 80 billion RISC-V cores by 2025. I still think that this number is low. And I think that this number is low because, you know, you have the show and tell crowd who are busy saying, hey, I'm doing risk five, and here's all the risk five I'm doing. And then you have the hide and seek crowd that they have risk five tucked under the covers of all kinds of things. They're just not, they're promoting that. When you buy a cake, you don't generally know where the baking soda came from. Same idea. You don't necessarily buy something because, oh, you know what? I'm going to buy that really cool watch because it has RISC-V in it. You buy the cool watch for the features and functions it's delivering. Same thing when you buy a car. You're maybe buying it for infotainment or safety or a variety of other reasons, but you don't go car shopping based on the, the microprocessor. So the explosion is happening. It started and embedded in IoT, and we're continuing to see that as the greatest, strongest growth area. Oh, and by the way, the VC community is seeing this too. And that's why there are so many design shops, because there's huge opportunity. There are no uh, entrenched, um, you know, sort of monopoly kinds of companies that are going after all of these new greenfield. The opportunity is there for everyone, and the barriers to entry are very low. So we see this happening in IoT, industrial, automotive are leading the way. These are the new workloads that we see coming out most prolifically now. RISC-V will shake up the $8.6 billion semiconductor IP market. We are well on our way to realizing this. And that's because of design flexibility and the technical nuances that I've described. So those are forecasts, predictions for the future. Where are we at today? Nearly a quarter, 23% of those ASICs have a RISC-V core on them already. So this means that this is already happening. This isn't the beginning of a revolution. We're no longer in the realm of early adopters. This is now becoming the reality that many folks are going to work for today. In fact, we're seeing everyone from large multinationals deepening their investment to more and more entrepreneurs and startups coming online. So the IP piece of that is well on its way. You see again, you know, where's 2021? Where are we at? So the IP is, is tracking extremely fast. And honestly, the software and tools is tracking very fast as well. 
as more and more workloads uh, come on to RISC-V, there's more and more opportunity. And we're seeing a lot of software being ported and run on uh, RISC-V. We have each of the major um, operating systems moving on to RISC-V, you know, Ubuntu, Red Hat, uh, Canonical, um, and SUSE. And then we start to see this going out into each of these different industries. So from embedded to enterprise, we're starting to see that proliferation of starting to move on to the risk five. In data center and cloud HPC, we've had a strong, uh, well, actually, I'm going to go into each of these. So let me just take a minute here. So, you know, Alibaba has really been public in their declaration of support for risk five and have shown real you know, roadmaps and made uh, significant contributions already. Uh, Imagination has, has come on board, and they're also really deeply involved in educating as well. And so you see, you know, from academia to HPC to uh, cloud providers, we see a lot of folks that are coming on uh, onto Risk Five. In telecom and communications, uh, you know, Alibaba has done a great, um, you know, effort for the entire industry and has brought Android onto Risk Five. We're still working with Google to get their official support as well. Uh, but there is a, now an Android SIG, a, a special interest group in RISC-V, that is really gaining a lot of attention. And we're eager to see not only Android, but the uh, uh, affiliated um, applications as well. And this is also very uh, involved here with the largest telecom provider in South Korea. In automotive, a little bit slower to, to start to get into the, the fast lane, I guess, to get on the road. Um, that is a pun. I got one laugh. Thank you. I'm going to get you a Starbucks later for that. Um, automotive has been a little bit slower. They have huge safety and, and security things that they need to pay attention to. And we've seen a lot of advances, both uh, you know, from the software team over at NVIDIA, as well as uh, Europe and kind of helping to bring some of their uh, GA Next uh, programming onto RISC-V, you know, it, for power consumption and, and electric vehicles. Uh, Renesas and Sci-5 are jointly developing solutions as well. IoT devices. So Huami is one of them that has uh, smartwatches. We see not only this, but we also have, uh, you know, um, earbuds or, or whatever they're called in various places and pieces that, you know, the, everybody calls them something different. I call them earbuds. Um, but, you know, we see a lot of those now coming with RISC-V as well. You know, you see things every, you know, from a small label printer to uh, soldering uh, sticks and all these other little devices that are coming on with RISC-V. Uh, as well as moving from there into personal computers, into other types of devices uh, used in the consumer space. So moving forward, uh, AI and ML. These are two categories of, uh, that are instrumental to finding differentiation and a competitive edge across various industries, whether it is a sensor and security in you know, a traffic system or it's the, you know, the differentiator in a cloud provider. Uh, AI and ML are, are being uh, brought to fruition across the board for uh, RISC-V. And then on edge computing, you know, Western Digital is one of them that has uh, you know, kind of really started to advance. Where do you, com you know, crunch the data? at the point of ingest whenever possible, right? Because they realize the weight of uh, storage and memory. Uh, we're continuing to see even more uh, acceleration in edge computing and bringing RISC-V to that forefront. So it takes all of us. It takes all of us to realize uh, the opportunity to innovate and to collaborate from chip providers uh, multinationals to students and universities. And we are engaging around this community, and there's a place in here for everyone. I've just walked through a number of charts that you could say, okay, the net message from that is everyone's doing it. But why should you do it? Why should you dedicate your time, your energy, your resources to risk five? Well, there's 
a lot of opportunity to be had. There is a lot of, uh, of ground that we can cover together. And we see a lot of folks coming on board. Uh, Risk V membership has been skyrocketing over the last couple of years. And it was, it was moving along pretty well. And we now had to adjust the chart. You know, it's one of those that looks pretty good. And then suddenly it starts to skyrocket. And that's what we're seeing today. And I think that this is a testament to you know, kind of getting past that early adopter phase. Uh, so now across 70 different countries, you know, 2,200 or more members, uh, we more than doubled. We grew 133% last year. We more than doubled already this year in the, in, in the first half. So moving forward, Risk Five International, our, our central organization, we have one mission. It's to make all of our community wildly successful on Risk Five. So there are a lot of things that we do. And across this, you know, Stefano is going to talk a little bit about what we're doing on the technical side of the house. That's, a, that's probably one of the most important things we do is technical deliverables. When it comes to open source, you know, you want to avoid forking or proprietary paths altogether. So our goal is to continue to produce extensions, useful tools, and other resources so that you can design implementations to uh, meet your uh, strategic goals and to become wildly successful. Uh, to do that, we want to make sure that you're compatible to the base profiles and platforms. We want to give you visibility. We want to make sure that we highlight not only what we as an organization are doing, but the many successes of the folks in our community. So those things are really important to us. But digging deeper than that, we need to fuel the entire community. And that means bringing up uh, skills across our learn platform, uh, which includes universities. It includes uh, online learning. It includes training partners. It includes uh, you know, engaging in all kinds of forums to share what Risk Five can do and to meet with you out in the market, which is really what advocacy and alliances are about. So advocacy and alliance are, you know, you've met Drew Fastini, he's here, he's one of our ambassadors. We have ambassadors, you know, a dozen or so around the world. We also have a couple dozen uh, meetup groups or local groups around the world that are engaging engineer to engineer. And then we have alliances with a few dozen uh, different organizations regional alliances, industry-based alliances, very technical-oriented alliances uh, to work together and collaborate. And then finally, you know, it all comes down to uh, you know, making sure that you have commercial success. So we have something called Risk V Exchange for that. I'm going to hand it over to Stefano to talk a little bit about where we are on our technical journey uh, and uh, invite you to join on that. been quite a bit of industry innovation over the past 10 years that RISC-V has been around. There's, uh, we have, uh, since the inception in 2010, the first ratification of RISC-V. Uh, there have been incremental improvements that we've seen along the way. So we've seen proof of concept hardware. We've seen microcontrollers capable of running RTOSs like Zephyr. And finally, SOC is capable of running Linux. But I'd like to focus for a moment just on the innovations happening in 2021, because I think there's a lot of things happening that are really going to solidify how RISC-V runs Linux and how it can support a rich stack of software. So first off, I wanted to mention one of the uh, open source hardware projects that I'm really excited about. It comes out of Western Digital, and it's a core called the Swerve cores. So these cores are multi-threaded and combined into a CPU are capable of running Linux. But the key is that they're open source hardware. So you can go to GitHub and download the code yourself. This is a change in the way we can think about our stack and that now the bottom of the stack can actually be open source. But to have open source hardware, you need open source specifications. So there's several specifications that we're working on this year for ratification. The first one I'll talk about is the vector specification. So the vector specification has just gone to public review and should be ratified by the end of November. And we'll talk a little bit in, about the life cycle of a specification so that makes more sense. 
but the vector specification is allowing industry adopters to align around a common standard, not just to produce something that may be capable of running Linux, but also in their domain-specific applications. Likewise, we have the crypto and bit manipulation specifications. Again, allowing industry adopters to align around a standard, but then also solving the problem of how do we accelerate cryptographic algorithms inside our applications, things that are critical to Linux applications. Uh, we also have the hypervisor and virtual memory specifications. Virtual memory being, of course, core to running Linux, but then hypervisor opening the door to what comes tomorrow for RISC-V in the data center, in an automotive, where virtualization is crucial. So this is a lot of the work that's getting done in ratifying specifications for hardware for RISC-V. But that's not to say that there isn't a lot of work being done in the software world as well. So we've got several important communities that we're engaging with. Obviously, the kernel community that we engage with pretty much on a daily basis, but also with communities like compilers, so GCC and LLVM. There are uh, virtualization communities like KVM, uh, real-time operating systems like Zephyr, uh, embedded operating systems or embedded systems like uh, the Yocto project. These community ties are really solidifying how we connect that open source hardware through into open source software. And all of the communities benefit from this interaction. So I told you I'd talk a little bit about specifications and how we go through our ratification process. Uh, specifications actually start in special interest groups that C Callista mentioned earlier. This is where we're having conversations with different member organizations around where do we see gaps in RISC-V today, or what do we see as the future of RISC-V in the data center area? From these conversations, we're, we're developing these charters for task groups which have a defined set of deliverables. We then spin off these task groups to go off and do the work and to iterate over several versions on a specification that they think is ready for publication. But before the publication of that specification happens, there are several ratification requirements that are needed. And probably most important is the 45-day public review period. So the reason I say that's the most important is because it's core to what makes RISC-V open source. Now, membership in RISC-V is free. And you can become a member for free and contribute to the development of a specification. But even without being a member, you can sign up for our public mailing lists and participate in these 45-day review periods. This gives you a chance as a community member of whatever open source community you're a part of to comment on and discuss these specifications before they go to ratification. This brings the open source conversation in as early as possible, before the actual ratification and before the tasks are complete that make it ready for ratification. Once those tasks are all complete, the 45-day review period is finished, and those comments have all been addressed, then we take the specification to the Technical Steering Committee and the Board of Directors for ratification. There we go. So as this eye chart will attest, <laughs> There has been a lot of uh, amazing innovations happening in RISC-V, and still many innovations more to come. And really, I think that's the part that gets me excited, is that there's still a lot of really interesting work that needs to be done, and all of it's being done in the, in the open. So as an example, I mentioned the cryptography extensions. The cryptography extensions are actually just one version of cryptography, the scalar extensions. We still have vector extensions left to ratify. Likewise, there is a trusted execution environment for RISC-V. It's called uh, physical memory protection. However, when you compare that environment to more mature environments like ARM's Trust Zone or Intel's SGX, there's still a lot of really interesting work to be done on RISC-V. This gives community members and developers a chance to participate in research and development of new and innovative ideas that has never been done in the public sphere before. It's always been behind some closed door. And that's the thing that, to me, really gets me excited about the innovation happening in RISC-V, is all the stuff that's left to come, and things like cryptography, security, data center, and automotive. So for all of this stuff to work, and there is quite a lot of work to be done, <laughs> We realize we're not going to do it alone, so we've, we've spun up several different technical programs to help us achieve all these goals. The first I'll talk about, and probably one of the most important, is the developer boards. The developer board program was started because we realized for several types of industries, for example, in automotive or in embedded, 
Hardware is a must. Until you get hardware in someone's hands, into an engineer's hands, you're not going to make progress on moving that forward. So to do that, we've opened up a program where engineers can apply to have these development boards shipped to them free of cost. Now, there is a catch, but the catch is that they have to contribute back to open source. So they have to explain to us, this is the open source project I'm going to be working on, and this is how I'm going to upstream my changes. So by bringing communities together and putting the hardware in the hands of the people who are going to do the work, we not only benefit the RISC-V community, but the other communities like GCC and KVM that are going to participate because we enabled the engineers to do the work they needed to do. Now, we realize we're not going to be able to put a uh, piece of hardware in everyone's hand on our budget. So <laughs> we do have the RISC-V lab program as well. The RISC-V lab program has just started. It's, it's pretty much in its nascence, but I think it's going to be one of the more interesting open source hardware projects out there in that it's going to allow labs that already exist in academia and in, and in corporations and also new labs that want to spin up and store hardware to allow folks to run continuous integration, regression testing, and actually log into RISC-V hardware so that they can test their applications and test their ideas before they bring them uh, into a specification or bring them to the uh, RISC-V communities for more development. Now, this has just gotten started, but we already have two different academic institutions and one uh, corporate uh, institution that's helping us to run this. And we're looking forward to adding more members to the RISC-V lab in 2022. Uh, another program that we've gotten started is the RISC-V Developer Partner, uh, sorry, the RISC-V Development Partner Program. One of the things we realized early on was that the architects and the designers that are helping to write these specifications may not also be the right people that are going to be writing the tests or that are going to be integrating the golden model or that are going to be upstreaming work to GCC. So what we did was we compiled all the members of our community into one area where those are the core tasks that those, that those folks work on. And what this has allowed is a clean handoff from the writing of the specification through to the ratification tasks I, I mentioned earlier. Those requirements like upstreaming changes to GCC and LLVM or upstreaming changes to the kernel are critical to the specification's success, but may not be the core competency of those architects that design, this, that design the spec. So we've, again, got a bunch of academic institutions and corporations that are already participating in this. But I'm excited to say we also have lots of community and individual members that have chipped in. So for example, we have a SAIL golden model that is part of our uh, architectural tests for compatibility. Th that model has been written not only by academic uh, institutions and students, but also by individual community members who are interested in formal specifications. And how can we assure that these specifications that we're uh, writing actually do the things we want them to do in the real world. So as part of our compatibility, we're building on platforms and profiles that are uh, up for ratification this year that are going to create a bar to which anyone looking to implement RISC-V can show, here's a level of compatibility to which I guarantee my product will have. And we've got all these great programs standing behind them to help them upstream the work that they need to upstream. Speaking of porting software over and upstreaming stuff to, uh, for RISC-V, I did want to mention a couple of different porting efforts that came across our desk recently. So uh, libraries like SPDK and DPDK uh, are pretty robust and complex libraries, but as you can see, only took weeks or uh, days or even weeks for them to port. Now, there are a couple of reasons behind this. A lot of times you have a corporate interest or a large group of people that are interested in moving these things forward. But the great thing is that we've got a community willing to help people port stuff forward. So as you're trying to bring your applications into the RISC-V uh, ecosystem, there's a whole group of people willing to help with that effort. And that's really the key that, to what helps RISC-V succeed, is building off of this low-level hardware community and allowing it to build all the way up through to the software stack. So I mentioned there's a lot of different communities. And I promise this will be the last eye chart. But if you look at all the different groups that we're involving them with to create an open source ecosystem, the thing that really sticks out to me is that the ISA is at the heart of it. So unlike before where you might have had an open source software stack, now you've got an open source ISA at the heart. And I've already mentioned there are open source hardware implementations out there. And what this does is allows the open source community to reach out into a branch that it hasn't been able to reach before. And that's an open source ecosystem that stretches from the hardware, from the ISA, all the way through to the user and software. 
And that's something that's never been done before and something that's really exciting. So with that, I'll pass back off to Callista to talk a little bit about uh, visibility opportunities. Thank you, Stefano. So I challenge you, where do you find yourself in this chart, right? Everybody's doing it. Where are you in this chart? This is about how we build community beyond risk five, beyond our members and into the larger industry. Maybe your interest is very uh, industry specific. I still think we have a place for all of us in this chart. And that brings us to visibility, one of the big uh, areas that we use to support the commercial success and the success of all of our members, if they're in academia or research uh, the, included as well. Uh, there are many ways that we look to showcase the success of the community, to recognize and appreciate the strides and the investment and the dedication of our community. And these are just a few of the ways I know Stefano promised his was the last eye chart, but we have more. Uh, we have lots to talk about. And these charts will be available for everyone uh, to, to consume. But we invite you to engage with us. Engage in the many ways that we can showcase your success and that we can support you. We can support you in your advocacy to dig deeper in investment with your organizations. Uh, to uh, look for ways to bring your technical teams to risk five to accelerate your traction in your journey because there are so many great reasons to do so uh, from uh, you know cost savings in you know taking a risk five approach to design flexibility to accelerated road roadmaps to uh, infusing your technical uh, strategic point of view into the ratified specifications as Stefano was talking about you know, the importance of, of that ratification review period and all the processes and steps that we take, it's because we do freeze it. It does act like a standard at the end of the day. Uh, and we want as, as much thought leadership in there as possible. So we'll, we'll close now. Uh, we'll bring it uh, to some Q&A time. We've got plenty of time for that. Um, but wanted just to highlight that we are here uh, and on the show floor. If you come by, you can also get some risk five fashion uh you know this is uh, this year's uh t-shirt and would love to share those with you we are also having a uh, a boff on thursday uh, for the first half of the day where we'll go deeper and we'll engage more with the community around what uh, is happening in risk five from software to hardware and all things in between and i promise it's going to be fun if you're in the Bay Area or you have friends, family, co-workers in the Bay Area, please invite them to join us at our summit, which will be uh, co-located with uh, DAC and Semicon West at the Moscone Center in San Francisco in early December. Uh, so we're super excited about that. It will be a hybrid uh, online and in-person event. So please join us for these and please uh, come in and join us here. Stefano's here, uh, Kim is here. Uh, to, we can talk visibility, technology, industry, outlook, and all things in between. So thank you, and I welcome any questions. Yeah? Question about the risk five lab uh, idea. Is this like any company, even a small company, we can post a rack of hardware and like run ports of what we are interested So the question is on how uh, can you engage as a risk five lab or leverage a risk five lab and is there a certain construct on the software? Uh, how, how does that work? How does a risk five lab work? And I'll, I'll let Stefano answer that one. Yeah, so, so right now we're still just in the process of building risk five labs. Um, so uh, we've chosen a uh, continuous integration platform. So we're gonna be using BuildBot to actually do the work. Um, but we haven't actually completed the list of tests that we're going to be running, so we don't know exactly, like, here's the list of, you know, regression tests and here are the, here's the CI pipeline you're going to be looking at. But we're in discussions and now into what, are we, what can we do and what's already being done out there so that we don't duplicate efforts. 
Those are the two of the big things going on now. And then in terms of like who can sign up, absolutely anyone can sign up. This isn't going to be restricted in any way. I think the main thing is going to be that in order to um, in order to call yourself a risk 5 lab, there'll probably just be a bar to which you have to meet. It may just be, here's the architecture you're going to need to build for, and here are the tests we need to see being run, that sort of thing. So the question is on, you know, what role does RISC-V play in the larger disaggregated data center and uh, how are we advancing that? And, uh, you know, our friend here from Seagate is uh, excited to hear more about that. Uh, so, you know, to answer that, you know, I'm not sure what all of the technical platforms are that we're using there, but as we see it advancing in hyperscale and in data centers, we're, at, at, you know, kind of a, akin to what you would see in a scale-out um, HPC environment. Many of the variables are quite similar, uh, and, and that's kind of the advance that we're seeing, um, you know, before it gets into full production. Uh, Alibaba is perhaps our most vocal uh, proponent for this and um, you know, using it, uh, many are using it initially in some of the acceleration. Um, not sure how many, uh, Western Digital is using it I think more around some of the memory. Um, but you might, uh, do you have a point of view? Yeah, the only thing I would add is we do have a data center special interest group that just spun up. So they're having conversations now around memory fabrics and around things like smart NIC and you know what are the what are the things that we see in terms of uh, goals for tomorrow that we should be stretching for, and where are the gaps today that we need to address so that you know when we're looking at smart Nick down the road, what are the things that we're going to trip over? So that group has started meeting. Alibaba certainly shows up every week, but there are uh, folks from several other companies that come in, and uh, yeah, I think we announced it on the public mailing lists a month ago, so it's still relatively new, but yeah, absolutely getting getting some steam. And I think that, you know, from what I'm seeing on that level, um, folks are not necessarily looking to rip and replace the millions that they've poured into existing architectures and investments, but they're looking at risk five, uh, you know, primarily in new investments and new space where they don't have existing entrenched investments. Uh, and we are working very closely, you know, with, you know, Open Power and others on how do you um, kind of position for the portability it, or multiple architectures living together uh, in harmony. Uh, and so that is, I think, the direction things are going as, you know, folks start to shift over time and next generations uh, onto more of an open approach to hardware. More questions? No, that's a great question. Mind if I? Yeah, go okay, for it. good. You can get first because <laughs> I'm excited. Um, no, that's I'm excited Stefano because Stefano is not looking for a job. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm excited because we actually just uh, we're spinning up some training, uh, and that uh, that training that we're going to be doing that certification, it, we're meeting with folks in the industry to say. Um, you know, what would you look for in hiring someone? And so, you know, here are the skill sets that you see lacking in your applicants, and that's the kind of training that we want to spin up. And I can say just, you know, looking at the uh, people that I work with every day and the kind of thing they're struggling for, it's really a mix. There's a lot of software needs that are out there, people who understand sort of the, the whole stack from, you know, the compiler on down to the architecture, but then also just folks who are looking for verification engineers, or, you know, it's hard to find verification engineers that haven't already been gobbled up. So, yeah, it is a new opportunity for lots of, uh, you know, young graduates, but then also folks just looking to make a career change as well. And some fun facts. So we launched our first online RISC-V learning, which part of it Stefano helped to write. And we've had like 6,000 people take these classes, and it is one of the fastest growth uh, online learning that Linux Foundation has seen, ever. 
Um, and so they have been blown away by the numbers who are signing up for our courses. And that's just what we're offering. You know, Imagination has invested tremendously in a college level course that, that they're making available. We have you know, half a dozen different training partners that are giving like large group training. Um, there are thousands of folks that are taking uh, online learning in other pockets around the world. Uh, this is a huge uh, push across universities. Um, you know, Pakistan has basically said, you know, risk five in all universities and have set up uh, specific training institutes. Uh, India, thousands of folks in India have been going through risk five training and online courses as well as, you know, like week long deep dive sessions um, to bring skill levels back up. Yeah. Job board. Oh, and we have a job board too. We, we've launched a lot of things this year. <laughs> it's been a busy we year. also have a job board that is available uh, that where we're posting internships. Uh, our internships have, have gotten a lot of attention and our members are able to post and, and we see a growth there as well of available risk five jobs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and Danny, Danny at <laughs> Future Way is hiring as well. And, and he also is wearing his risk five fashion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now, go. Uh, you know, a lot of the design and universities are going to be using FPGAs to, to design the things, but where are the ships being manufactured? Is there any distribution globally, or is it all in China, or like what? Where is that being done? The actual like, okay, we, we designed a ship, and now somebody's going to produce it. Right. So the question is around, you know, how many FPGAs are are available and where are chips being produced? I think most of the production is happening in China, uh, and that's sort of a global statement, I think, on most architectures. Um, but, uh, you know, I, and we have several FPGA projects that have, have spun up. There's, I, I forget the name of the FPGA group that Naveed just started, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do have a soft CPU uh, group that specializes in the FPGA end, but from, like, spinning the actual ASICs from the actual production of the chip. I think of, you'll obviously see a large uh, quantity of that coming out of Asia, but I think you've already started to see, if you're watching the news, like local state size folks talking about what RISC-V is in their future, like in terms of actually producing, if not, you know, CPUs, but actually domain specific processors or, you know, some. Right, from a fab level. Like, yeah, more... I, I think, not, not to sort of read the tea leaves, but I think uh, long term, yes. I think because the architecture itself is open source, it's lending itself more to fabrication techniques and industry techniques that are more open. Uh, but that's something that really will change the entire fabrication industry. And so that's something that, you know, we may see farther down the line. Right. Right. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining or tuning in or dialing in later. I <laughs> uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.